Hey everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna look at one of the most common high-speed design rules that I see people putting out there, and that rule is related to the 25% rise time guideline that I see all the time. That guideline is not necessarily meant to be a design guideline. However, people often use it as a design guideline because they want an excuse to not calculate impedance. I'm very surprised by this, given the number of free online calculators that are actually quite accurate out there on the internet. So, I'm gonna run over this rule, why it was invented, and how to actually use it correctly to analyze things in your PCB. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, what am I talking about when I refer to the 25% rise time? The 25% rise time rule actually comes in many different forms. And basically this rule states that if your interconnect is short enough and it's shorter than some proportion of the rise time, then you don't need to worry about the impedance of your transmission line. People throw out all sorts of numbers for this guideline. I've seen one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, one eighth, one tenth, one twelfth, and one twentieth. So that's eight different numbers for this rise time guideline. I'm gonna just say this. If a guideline has eight different values that you should follow for its correct usage, it's probably not a very good guideline. So basically what this guideline says is that if I have a driver circuit here, we'll just call this DRV, and it's sending out a signal along a trace to a load, and this trace is short enough, then the characteristic impedance of this trace, Z0, does not matter, meaning that the signal will only seed the load impedance, Z sub L. So if we know our interconnect length, L here, then what we can say is if L is less than the velocity of the signal multiplied by the rise time, multiplied by some fraction, the most common one being 25%, then this transmission line essentially appears invisible to this signal. And you don't need to worry about the transmission line impedance. Now, in a very broad sense, meaning that if you collapse the length of this interconnect to zero, then that statement will be true. And the signal will only see the load impedance and this Z0 value will essentially be invisible to the signal. What really happens depends on the input impedance, Z sub in, looking into this interconnect. And what happens is this Z sub in is some function of this length and the propagation constant along this trace. Now it's also a function of the Z sub zero value. Generally, when we design this interconnect, we're trying to hit a target of input impedance at this point where we inject the signal into the line to be some fixed value. For most interfaces, for a single-ended line, it's 50 ohms. For a differential line, this value for the input impedance might also be 50 ohms, but in this case, we're looking at the odd mode impedance and not the characteristic impedance. So remember, odd mode impedance and a differential pair and characteristic impedance of a single line are not always the same thing. We have some other videos talking about that. I'll link to those in the description. Go check those out. Now, this number right here that you calculate using the signal speed and the rise time is often called a critical length. So meaning that if your actual trace length is less than this critical length, then you don't need to worry about Z0. It can be any value that you want. The reality here is that this critical length is not just this fixed value for every interface. What actually matters is the deviation of the input impedance from your target impedance. So you can express this as like an error in some percentage, so multiplied by 100% here. If your interface can tolerate a larger deviation in the input impedance, from this target value of 50 ohms, then this value for the critical length will actually be longer. And it could have no relation to some fixed value like 
So one of the main points of this video is to point out, and we're actually gonna calculate this using an example in just a moment, but I wanna point out that this 25% value is totally arbitrary, as are all the other seven values that I've heard commonly and I talked about earlier in the video. So all of those values are very arbitrary and they probably shouldn't be trusted in most interfaces. Instead, what you should do is one of two things. First, you should actually calculate the input impedance deviation and figure out what kind of error you can tolerate. So that's actually kind of a difficult calculation. And I'll show you how to do it, but it is a bit of a difficult calculation. The other option is just design this trace to the target impedance, which is actually very easy. There are many different calculators that you can use to do that. I'm gonna to link to some in the description, so you can go check out those on the Altium blog. There is, of course, the impedance calculator built into the Stackup Manager in Altium Designer. And if you start looking on Google, you'll find dozens of other calculators that essentially do the same thing. Some of those calculators are less than accurate because, of course, they ignore things like skin effect and they ignore the DC resistance. They ignore the loss tangent, so they're only giving you the lossless impedance. But they're pretty good for getting an estimate of the impedance that you would see in your board. So now, how do we calculate this input impedance? And if, of course, you remember some definitions for input impedance, this input impedance actually depends on the propagation constant, which is a function of frequency. So what frequency do we care about when we calculate the input impedance? So I've prepared an example I'm gonna run through on screen. Let's go take a look. So I'm on my computer right now and I have a little spreadsheet that I've created to do input impedance calculations. And the purpose of this sheet is specifically to figure out at what length does the input impedance looking into a transmission line start to diverge from the load impedance. So up here in the top row, I have my first two pieces of information that we need for this calculation. We don't need this right here, but what we need is the line impedance. And so here I'm just using 100 ohms as an example. So let's just suppose that I have an interconnect and the impedance of that line is 100 ohms, but my load is terminated at 50 ohms. And I wanna send a digital signal into that line. The question we then want to ask is, at what length does my input impedance deviate from my actual impedance? So what I've done here is I've calculated a length here, and this length is in meters. So here you can see that we've got this spanning all the way up to about a quarter of a meter, so 25 centimeters. And then here we have the input impedance that's being calculated for some of this data. So the data over here, I have a DK of four, we're assuming strip lines. I have a velocity here, so this is essentially the speed of the signal. I have a loss tangent, so I can calculate my propagation constant, real and imaginary parts. And now what we're doing is we're assuming that we have a signal and we're assuming the bandwidth that we care about in this signal spans up to, in this case, 100 megahertz. So that would be sufficient for a 200 megabit per second bit stream, assuming two signal levels, no further modulation. Then I'm assuming here that we have a rise time of one nanosecond. So this is one E negative nine. That's my one nanosecond rise time. And so I know how far the signal travels during that rise time. And that's listed right here. So that's what I've called my rise length in meters here. So it's 150 millimeters. Now suppose that my actual line impedance as it exists on the PCB is 100 ohms. We then ask at what length do we need to start worrying about the impedance of that line? Well, what we do is we look at the input impedance. Here, the input impedance is a complex number, so there is a complex term associated with it. You can see that if you just widen out this column. But here, I've calculated the absolute value just to make it simple. So here, at about 0 0.017 meters, or 17 millimeters, you can already see that for this signal, with a required bandwidth of 100 megahertz and a rise time of one nanosecond, that I already have a 10% impedance deviation. So if I just calculate this fraction as a function of my rise time length, you see that already at a 10% deviation occurs when I have routed 11% of that rise time length. So that would be a 1 -tenth fraction here. So the point here is that if you can only tolerate a 10% deviation in your input impedance, 
for this 100 ohm line, then you would want to limit your critical length to one tenth the distance that the signal travels during its rise time, not one fourth. And in fact, if we just scroll down here a little bit, we see that at one fourth of the signal rise time, we actually see that this has a 20% impedance deviation. So we can see that right here. We have a target of 50 ohms, but the actual input impedance is almost 61 ohms. So when we're at 25% of our rise time, we see here that we have a very large impedance deviation. So the question you have to ask yourself is this, can we accept a 20% impedance deviation on this interconnect or can we only accept a 10% impedance deviation on this interconnect? So in general, the larger impedance deviation that you can accept, the longer this interconnect can be before you absolutely must match the impedance of the transmission line to the load. Let's look at another example. Let's just suppose that instead of a 100 ohm line, we have a 65 ohm line. So for a 65 ohm line, when do we get a 10% impedance deviation? Well, if I scroll down here, you can see now that if my line was already 65 ohms, but I have a target of 50 ohms, you can see here that I don't get a 10% impedance deviation until I am about a third of the distance traveled by the signal during its rise time. So you can see here I have 0.36 or 36%. So that would be a one third rise time rule or just a little smaller than that. If I'm already closer to my target impedance, now my critical length can be longer. So this is where you get these other fractions that come about for this critical length rule. The critical length rule really depends on a number of different factors. Those factors, if not precisely controlled when you're doing your design, you're actually going to ignore the impedance of a line when you absolutely must design to a target impedance of your line. So doing all of this correctly would require that you calculate the impedance anyways, because as you can just see here, I have to know the line impedance ahead of time when I'm doing this calculation. So that begs the question, why don't you just design to the target impedance to begin with? That's exactly what you should do in high speed impedance controlled buses. Just design to the target impedance and then you don't have to worry about all of this stuff. Now, if you wanted to go through this exercise and actually do this, then if you were gonna use this as a design rule, this would require that you create a length constraint on your interconnects. So you can create length constraints on your interconnects and there is a length design rule. If you go into a blank PCB and you go into the rules section in Altium Designer, you'll see right here that there is an area where you can create rules that limit interconnect lengths for target nets. And in fact, if I go in here, I can actually apply this to everything. I can apply this to all nets, to specific net classes, only nets on a single layer, and so on and so forth. So my view is don't worry about doing all of this because it just takes too long and you're gonna have to calculate the impedance of your traces as they appear on the PCB regardless. So you might as well just design to the target width anyways. To do that, just go into the layer stack manager and when you have your layer stack pulled up, click on the impedance tab at the bottom of the layer stack manager and you can create a new impedance profile and this will allow you to calculate the width required to hit this target impedance that you need on any layer in your PCB. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. My hope is that you now have some context behind these rules. When you see them online, don't just trust them automatically because they may not apply to your specific interface. Make sure to keep following us by hitting that subscribe button. You'll be able to keep up with all of our tutorials as they come out. And of course, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.